What's the matter with that cat there? Must be full of reefer. Full of reefer? Yeah, man. You mean that cat's high? Sailing. Sailing? Sailing lightly. We now wander off the beaten path with an update from the Reefer Reporter. Welcome to the Reefer Reporters with Cannabis News Hawks, Kim Cooper, and myself, Al Graham of the Pace Radio Show. Today we are going to talk and discuss the cannabis news from the week of January the 16th through to the 22nd of 2018. Hello, Kim. How are you? Doing pretty good. I'm loving my uh, life up here in the north and enjoying all of the exciting cannabis news that's coming out in uh, local newspapers and from across the country. Yes, it's great, eh? There's lots of it. There certainly is. There certainly is. Yes. Yeah, so today on the show, we're gonna we're gonna go all across Canada from from coast to coast, and we're gonna head down to uh, the U.S. as well. We're gonna cover stories about taxation, vapor lounges, uh, opinions on things, some new businesses joining with uh, licensed producers. What else are we gonna touch on, Kim? Oh, a whole bunch of stuff, a little bit from the past as well as a little bit from the future. Uh, All kinds of good and interesting stuff in the news this week. Uh, Starting off with one of our faves in the business, Miss Abby Roach. You've got a hat trick on the Reefer Reporters. You're a third week in a row that you are our top story. And yep, Abby made the news once again this week coming out of uh, Global News, I believe. Yes, yes it is. It says that Ontario is considering allowing licensed cannabis consumption lounges in the province. They're looking to regulate them and license these people. Yes, uh, Miss Abby is very excited about this proposal. Uh, the bet being met by general optimism from cannabis activists and municipalities across the country, across the province, excuse me. Uh, you know, Abby has been in the legal uh, gray area uh, for consumption lounges for almost two decades now. So this is exciting news coming from the Ontario government that they are now considering licensing safe consumption spaces in Ontario. Yeah, they even want some public feedback on that as well. You know, they're looking for, you know, uh, people's comments on how they should um, go ahead about licensing and regulating uh, the consumption of these lounges. Absolutely. And that's exactly what Abby said. You know, she's the owner of the Hotbox Cafe in Toronto. The lounge opened in 2003, and she's been asking the province to do legalization and give her a license to operate for almost six years now. Yes, she has been, and she was just just before um, uh, the Legislative Committee just recently to uh, talk to them about uh, easing up the rules on, on consuming cannabis. Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, and, and to put it like Abby says it, do you want to hang out at Kathleen Wynn's Lounge, she asked? There has to be a level of innovation in this industry, and there has to be a level of privatization. Uh, this, this new current regime can't be solely run by the province and the feds. Uh, private business and personal businesses uh, need to be able to flourish with this new, new uh, industry that we have in Canada. Yeah, you know, they'll be required, as they already do now. There's like, there's, there's a lot of self-regulation that they're doing, you know, checking for ID, making sure that minors aren't in there, you know, ventilation. And I know at Abby's, in her establishment, it's vaporizing only on the inside. That's correct. She's got a nice little private backyard area that's, you know, got some tables out there and stuff. Uh, music venue is out there as well for entertainment. And if you're consuming anything other than a vaporized product, you're asked to go to the outside area. You know, and, and that's the way a lot of these are being run these days. As another quote from Miss Abby, she says, A private lounge is a wonderful alternative as long as it is registered and regulated. The municipalities would have some form of oversight. If they're not regulated, it will be the wild, wild west. And that's what she's trying to avoid with licensing and regulation. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's, uh, they've got support as well from one of the council members in Toronto, uh, Jim Carey Giannis. He used to be a Liberal MP at one time. Uh, he's uh, on the city's licensing and standards committee. He's uh, supportive of this, but he also understands that there has to be, you know, um, stuff as far as controls and safeties for the employees and and for the people who are attending these places. So, 
Absolutely, you know, and with the hot box and other lounges that are in the, the M- uh, Metro Toronto area, uh, we've proven, these establishments have proven that these safety ensuring methods uh, are available. They're happening already. Abby has operated her business uh, for 18 years, almost two decades, and there's never been an incident at the hot box cafe. So the people that are operating these businesses already have those safety insured uh, in place in place now yeah yes yeah exactly you know it's it's pretty obvious uh that when you look at a a vapor lounge you take your top five vapor lounges and you take the top five um liquor establishments and when you look at where you know where the problems lie you're going to find them over at the the places where the bars are super busy on a friday and saturday night versus uh, a cannabis lounge Absolutely. I mean, you can ask any police officer in any city in any country, uh, you know, which one they're more feel fearful of going to uh, a lounge, a vapor lounge type situation where they've got a call or a bar where people are intoxicated. If you call it, get a call for a police officer to go to a bar, 10 cruisers show up. If you get a call, right. that's never happened. But if you were to get a call to go to a vapor lounge, possibly one cruiser with a single police officer would show up to be yeah. a public relations liaison for the situation yep for sure okay let's move on to our next story kim i think absolutely that, i think this uh, next story sounds like it deserves a cheer and that happens to be the liberal mps urging uh that they drop the criminal penalties for all illicit drug use and some people would say, why, Al, would you give a cheer to decriminalizing all drugs? Well, well comes, yeah, go ahead. There, there's lots of reasons to decriminalize all drugs. Uh, Portugal comes to mind as the one country that has done this successfully. Uh, you know, opiate addiction has gone down. They look at it as a public health issue rather than an issue of law. Exactly. Since Portugal, which is the same model that uh, these, this is going to be discussed with their, um, uh, what do you call it, their, at their convention and that, if it gets into that that far, um, they say that because of Portugal's, the number of deaths have, of drug overdoses have dropped significantly. Um, problematic drug use has decreased. The number of people in drug treatment has increased, which is good. The um, number of people arrested and sent to criminal courts has declined by 60%. Yeah. And, and this alleviating the court system to take care of more pressing criminal matters that aren't getting tossed yeah. out because the courts are overcrowded yeah. with nonviolent arrests. Yeah. And, you know, the cost, the cost to society has decreased by almost 20%, which is and amazing. 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 Exactly. Amazing, amazing. So, you know, our, the resolution is now put forth to the Canadian government to treat their drug abuse as a health issue and expand, yeah. uh, expand treatment and harm reduction services and classify low-level possess, drug possession and consumption as administrative violations. Yeah. Excellent uh, initiative, for sure. Yeah, it, it's, you know, it's not about... Uh, some people might think decriminalizing... Uh, all drugs would be well. Then they're going to become more available. They're going to be sold on, uh, you know, at stores and stuff. Well, no, it's got nothing to do with that. It's it's channeling people into, um, you know, the health benefits, into directions of getting rehab and so on and so forth. It's the fact that it's, it benefits it's done to commu- to society as the things I just listed out. Absolutely. You know, I mean, the the numbers are there in Portugal since they've adopted this new resolution in in that country. And in Canada here, almost 3,000 Canadians died from opioid-related causes in 2016. That number has grown in set 2017, and it's going to continue to rise in 2018. This could be an alternative to get people, um, you know, off of off of harder drugs and get some help focusing this on the health regime rather than the criminal regime is definitely a step in the right direction yeah 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 i completely agree and i know that the i know while the percentage is low i know that i'm not alone and there's others out there absolutely Uh, obviously if it's getting this far 
there's there's a pile of people who are listening so all right kim where are we going now we've uh, we've got about uh four minutes till we go to our new music break well, I'd like to talk about taxation before we get into the next break. Uh, there's been a new, uh, it's, it's an opinion piece. This piece comes out of Policy Options. Uh, it's a website that houses opinion pieces on the net. Uh, this, there's a, a gentleman by the name of Greg Engel. He is the CEO of Organigram in Moncton, New Brunswick. And he is jumping on the bandwagon of uh, Jonathan Zaid's Canadians for Fair Access to Medical Marijuana opposing the taxation of medical cannabis. Uh, Organigram CEO states that they believe uh, that cannabis should not be taxed at all, never mind have an excise tax. No, hey, I agree completely. There shouldn't be any tax whatsoever on cannabis. You know, we're, we're, they're selling this to people who are obviously on low, low income. If, if it's not obvious that probably 90% of them are on low income, low income, you know, people who are sick, seriously sick, you know, they're not going to work every day making huge salaries. You know, some of them are having to go to work, yeah, but some of those people are, are working at low wages. You know, there's low income, and yep. uh, yeah, any way of you know removing the taxes, uh, yeah, it's 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 no brainer to me. It's a it's a right move to go. Absolutely, you know, the price of cannabis is is fairly high in Canada in the medical per- regime. Uh, you know, having taxes added on to that eliminates this as a medicine for many in low income brackets. Uh, people that are prescribed cannabis as a medicine, they say that up to two thirds of them do not get their prescription filled in full each month due to cost prohibitions. Yeah, and how much how much more medicine could that patient purchase if? That money was going to towards their cannabis instead of going to the tax man. It just doesn't make sense. Absolutely, you know, and any other prescription that is available in Canada that our doctors write us a prescription for, it would be unheard of to see a patient not get their medicine one month or you only get half the dose of that medicine that one month because of cost prohibitions. Uh, it, it wouldn't happen with any other pharmaceutical grade medication on the market. So why is it happening with cannabis? It's simply not acceptable for patients to be going without. No, no, exactly. It's not. It's not. Not when you see some articles that state that, you know, a licensed producer is producing a gram of cannabis for under two dollars. That's right. That's right. And now you're, it, it becomes cost prohibitive when that set price goes up to eight to twelve dollars a gram, sometimes more. Then you add on regular tax, and now the government is talking about this excise tax. It just puts it out of reach for patients. It's uh, it, it, and it needs to be stopped. Oh yeah, because uh, yeah, it's not right. You know, a patient can go in and get all kinds of medications uh, and not be taxed, but yet here we are. You know, dealing with a, a medication that more and more patients are, are you know, getting and getting access to. So, yeah, this discussion has to be done, and I believe uh, it has to end. Absolutely, and uh, kudos to Organigram for standing up as one of the LPs that are in favor of not taxing cannabis. I completely agree with you. They should, and it would be nice to see more of them get involved in it as well. For sure. Okay, okay, Kim. Well, before we go on to our next article, I think we're going to start something new here on the Reefer Reporters. I think we're going to take a 90-second music break, and when we come back, uh, we'll continue with our news. How's that? Sounds great, Al. We'll see you in a minute. See you in a minute. <laughs>
Okay, Kim, we're back from our music break, and uh, we'll continue with our news articles. Uh, just before the break, we were talking about one that involved Organogram, and it looks like we got another. Yes, Organogram is back in the news one more time with us today, and this time, unfortunately, it's the flip side. Yes, uh, it is. I think that's. I think we should give them some some lightning for this. All right, go ahead. <laughs> All right, well, Organigram, you're back in the news, Mr. CEO. Uh, when uh, the pain of Don Ray's downtowns, uh, Don Ray downtowns inflammatory arthritis kept her up at night, her pain specialist suggested she try marijuana. So she did. She got her license and she got her prescription for cannabis and she began ordering from Organigram Farms. This was a couple of years ago prior to the recall. Since that time, she's become ill and now she blames her Organigram Cannabis for the cause nice. of her new illness. I see here she says that uh, she lost, <clears throat> she's basically I lost all of 2016 to constant nausea around the clock and a constant vomiting or wrenching is probably a better way of putting it since I had nothing in my stomach and by the time I had lost a lot of weight and uh, she I was sick I was help, she was helplessly on the couch yeah yeah this was all now they're saying caused from the medical cannabis that she was receiving from a grand organigram which was subject to a recall last year uh they were found to be growing their cannabis to with some prohibited pesticides now the pesticides that they were using converted when uh used in inhalated or heated products uh, it converted the carcinogens that were contained in the cannabis to cyanide poisoning, which has caused the cause of this lady's nausea. Yes, well, and it's going to, well, it may just cost them because she is involved, she is part of a class action lawsuit against the uh, company. Um, she also says that she doesn't have, she doesn't believe how Canada's standards for cannabis are stringy, stringy enough uh, to protect the consumers. Yeah, that's for sure. Um, you know, when this went down, it was reported that, and I'm not positive that this was Organigram or not, but other companies were also found using the same pesticides. But it was reported that Health Canada inspectors did find containers of prohibited pesticides stored mm -hmm. in places like ceiling tiles of these facilities grow ups. So these companies were well aware that these products were prohibited and they actually yeah. tried to hide them. Yeah, which is very sad. So sort of so shows some guilt, doesn't it? It, it most certainly does. Um, you know, we, we cannot have a regime in the medical cannabis community in Canada that has dollars over patients' health. Um, mm. You know, these the substances substances are banned for a reason they cause illness they can even cause death uh, it, cannabis is different than any other product on the market because it's consumed by inhalation it's smoked when you add heat to these elements it changes the chemical makeup and makes them extremely bad for your health it sure does I think for anybody who uh, has some interest in this story or has consumed some of this cannabis during those recalls uh, this is an article that is, um, it's actually a, um, an interview with uh, Anna Marie Tremonti of CBC Radio on her show, uh, The Current. It's called Constant Nausea, uh, Hav Hav Halifax Woman Suing Medical Marijuana Producer After Becoming Ill. And you can, yeah, you can listen. Story. Yeah, excellent Yeah, you can listen to the interview itself, so... For sure. All right. So anybody out there should uh, should check that out for sure. I uh, so. And when you're not busy doing that... You definitely have to go and check out this latest article uh, from Lyft Magazine, Lyft News. I'm the show supporter of Noser and myself personally and great friend of mine, Matt Myrna, is uh, in a piece on from Lyft Canada this week, recounting his days of going to court with lawyer Paul Lewin for growing cannabis as a patient way back when at the start of all of this, eh, Al? Yes, oh, yeah, that was, uh, I remember that trial. I was uh, actually uh, 
covering it for uh, Treating Yourself magazine at the time. And, uh, you know, uh, Matt didn't, uh, you know, his case got pretty high in the courts, didn't get to the Supreme Court. But uh, as he says, what he's seeing now where more and more patients are getting access and the numbers under the ACMPR, uh, you know, that's, that's what's making him happy. Absolutely. Uh, you know, Health Canada has been keeping data on uh, the medical cannabis regime and patients uh, for quite some time. And Matt fought in part of his court case to get that data, those data numbers released to the general public because they wanted to keep them under wraps. They didn't want the general public to know how many people were actually involved in this. Uh, so, you know, his court case brought a lot of facts to light out of the Health Canada vaults. Yeah, it does. You know, here's I'm just uh, I'm just going through the article here again, and it says here uh, there's almost uh, there's t- over ten thousand doctors now signing for medical use in Canada in Canada. Yeah, yeah, over ten thousand four hundred and thirty-three. Uh, they're they're signing uh, right now in Canada. Uh, from a historic perspective, it's great to see those numbers. It sure is. <laughs> it sure is. Uh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Matt's... Now, Matt eventually won his case, uh, which effectively legalized cannabis. It was struck down by the Court of Appeal, but that's when we had the Harper government in. And, uh, you know, but his case did shed light on all of the numbers. And, uh, you know, they've yeah. been growing ever since. So this court case was very uh, poignant in, in, yeah. our, in our road to legalization today. And, and uh, I know uh, we've had him on the show recently. You can check back in our archives and uh, listen to that interview with Matt. Uh, we touched on his court case during that interview. Yes, we do. And he yeah. will be coming up uh, again in the near future on the Pace Radio Show for another interview, uh, renouncing some new enterprises going on with Mr. Myrna coming this spring. So stay nice. tuned for that. Yes, yeah, I, I, I'll be listening. <laughs> I'm waiting to hear that too. <laughs> I've known Matt, for, I've known Matt for a long time, so. Yeah, great. Uh, and and just just a quick note before yeah. we get off, Matt. If you do watch this, uh, go and uh, look at this article in Left Magazine. Take a look at the cover picture, and you'll see our one and only Mr. Al Graham in the background. As he said, he was reporting live from the courthouse for treating yourself cup. Yeah, I am in the background of that photo. So yes, uh, yeah. Uh, yes, I was. It was somebody pointed that out to me on Facebook. <laughs> yeah, hey, you're in the background there. Okay, uh, on to our next story, and this one, oh, I'm gonna have to give it another. Sounds like another thunderbolt to me. Yeah. Yeah. Quebec considers legal limit for THC. What is going on with Quebec? I mean, I, I, oh, Quebec, really? I don't understand you people over there in government. Um, you seem to want to just put reins on this entire industry and uh, pull it back into the dark ages. I just don't get it. It, it doesn't. It doesn't make sense. Doesn't make sense to me whatsoever. And they're they're going on. Well, there's so many kids that are developing psychosis. With, with cannabis, according to their doctor. Uh, she's the president of the association uh, AP, AMPQ. How's that? And, uh, hey, we're not talking about kids here. This is legalization for adults, not legalization for kids. This That's is, right. The government is promoting to get the legalization to keep it away from kids. That's right, and that's the and that's the laughable part. Their whole campaign is, you know, think about the children. Oh, what about the children? And that's what legalization is supposed to be taking care of. So, if the legalization regime is taking care of the children, why is it still an issue in Quebec? Uh, mm-hmm. Limiting the amount of THC in adult use cannabis is akin to limiting the amount of alcohol in Smirnoff vodka. Well, I guess, yeah, yeah. Well, I guess they do have a 40% alcohol limit here in Ontario, anyways. They don't in Quebec. They, I mean, no, you can no, buy high, exactly. Buy high, and that's why I brought that up. Like, Ontario <laughs> does have caps on that, but Quebec does not. No. You can buy stuff like Al Cool in Quebec, which is 90% alcohol. You can buy all yeah. kinds of things in Quebec. Uh, you know that are high alcohol. This this province has chosen not to limit the alcohol, but has chosen 
to limit the THC. Just seems like an oxymoron to me. Yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't seem right. Psychiatrists in Quebec say that they are seeing more and more patients with symptoms of psychosis, which includes hallucinations, like hearing voices or paranoia and delusions because of the cannabis use. <laughs> I don't know where they're getting these statistics from, but it's not from Stats Canada. I can tell you that. Well, you know. Can, I, I've never said cannabis is for everybody. I've, I've always said cannabis isn't for everybody. Alcohol isn't for everybody. Cheeseburgers aren't for everybody. You know? Yes. Yes, I agree with that wholeheartedly. But if, I, I, I don't agree with, with some of the stats they're reading off in this. You know, <laughs> to go on to some more, some Canadian, to quote this article, uh, they also state some Canadian companies are selling marijuana for online for about $4 a gram, and the THC levels are not necessarily listed, but can be as high as 80 to 90%. So... (laughs) Who who, who is selling cannabis for $4 a gram? Never mind being 80 and 90%. So, I mean, that kind of goes to the credibility of of the statements made in this article. Uh, You know, number one, there is no cannabis on the market that is 80 to 90 percent THC. Number two, you cannot find cannabis for four dollars a gram. So it calls into question pretty much every point that this article is trying to make. The AMPQ uh, suggests that they should set a limit at 15 or 16 percent THC with a lower limit of adults under the age of 25. Yeah, well, what now? We're, we're going to have uh, you know retailers asking for ID. Well, if you're uh, eight, nineteen to twenty-five, you can shop in this section, and if you're over twenty-five, you can shop anywhere. It's How's like te- it's like telling it's like telling eighteen eighteen to twenty-five year olds that they can only go to the beer store; they can't go to the liquor store. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, these people just aren't thinking clearly. Uh, yeah. you, you need to make this a regime that is actually going to work uh, and not uh, create a larger yeah. black market, which is the thing you're trying to get away from. Exactly. Well, this is an article written by Rachel Fletcher. She's with the Quebec City Correspondent and of uh, Global News. So you can check that out and see what, what, all, uh, what all that is about. So. Yeah, for yeah. sure. I think we're going to take a 90-second music break, and when we come back, uh, we'll continue with our news. How is that? Sounds great, Al. We'll see you in a minute. See you in a minute. When Mark Henry can be free To run his business and sell his seeds It's just a plant, it's just a weed Another victim of corporate greed It's simply business It's simply business It's simply business You know why they won't let us grow It's simply business We burn the oil and cut the trees While the captains of industry They run a big monopoly On everything but the birds and bees It's simply business It's simply business You know why they won't let us grow It's simply business Kim, on to our next article, which I believe, I, I believe it deserves a cheer. And I believe it deserves a cheer because he's a past guest on the Pace Radio Show and he is moving on up. 
He certainly is. Woo-hoo for Mr. Sasha Pristick. Uh, Sasha, of course, better known as the Joint Doctor, is the original uh, grower and geneticist that developed Lowrider Siege, which is the very first autoflower seed that came to the cannabis market and the cannabis community. A uh, great friend of the show, and Sasha is made the news this week, joining with an LP. Yes, he has. And that would be, uh, he signed with Subline Culture and MYM. Yeah, MYM Nutraceuticals. Uh, it's a, an LP in Canada that is focusing on organic growing and topical based uh, products as well as cannabis supplements. Nice. Sasha's just recently signed a deal with them to become a new geneticist and develop new products for this innovative company. Yes, he has. I see here he's also the first private recipient of a Health Canada Industrial Hemp Research License uh, in the province of Quebec. Yes, he is. He owns and operates his farm out there called Shazam Farms, which is also the home to Shazam Fest, which is a festival that happens every year on the grounds of Shazam Farms that's geared to natural living and a natural lifestyle. Yes, it's would be interesting. I'd like to maybe go check that out sometime. <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm hoping to get to Shazam Fest this year. We were trying to get to it last Last year, but we just ran out of time with all of the travel I did. But it is on my list of events to attend this year. Very exciting news for Sasha. He's been very active in the cannabis community uh, with growing an organic product and getting keeping it as close to nature as possible. Yes, that's good. That's what a lot of people are looking for. A lot of patients need, they're you know, wanting that. They want the organic stuff. I see he's also been dubbed the father of auto flowering, uh, widely adopted by other seed companies. Uh, auto flowering strains represent 40% of the European seed market right now. Yes, that's right. And uh, that's essentially why Sasha developed up the low rider strain as we found out on Pace Radio Show not too yeah. long ago when he was our guest. Yes, uh, yeah. You know, it was people in the European market that wanted to grow cannabis as a plant in their small garden boxes that they had on the outsides of their homes because uh, there wasn't a whole lot of space to grow large trees. Yes, that's right. That's right. And those auto flowering, yeah. I've, you know, I've seen the little short guys and everything. So it was it was good to have him on the radio show when we had, when we had him on the Pace Radio Show and we we're talking to him. So it's good to see you know another one. You know, some people say that uh, they're they're all against the LPs and everything, but this is another example of a cannabis advocate that has worked his way up and is getting involved. That's right. That's right. Working with the LPs, I mean, more LPs that are open to bring in some grassroots movers and shakers that have been in this business for decades already and got it off the ground. That's the way to go. Cooperation and amongst all of us that are in this business will make it expand at a much greater rate and it'll be effective for everyone. Yeah, exactly. I've had some talks with people about that lately. So, Okay, well, let's move on to our... Sasha. Yes, congratulations to Sasha. Okay, time to move on to the next story, which, yes, it needs some applause. And why do I give it some applause? Because the Ontario nurses need some money. They need some money in order to be able to train nurses for the upcoming you know, legalization. And it's Absolutely. always good. To, it's always good to train nurses. And, you know, we're not hearing enough training going on with cannabis, you know, in in the medical end, so this is good. It is, it is. Now, the, the article is kind of misleading. Um, the headline, but I mean, we know the news media out there, they're headline grabbers. That's what they do to try and sell their newspapers. Uh, the headline is a bit misleading. It states that the cannabis, uh, the nurses are, are asking for $48 million cannabis health lesson. But the uh, Nurses Association itself is not asking for that grand amount of money. They are asking for $600 hundred thousand dollars to teach nurses about cannabis not 48 million no exactly yeah it's probably for a bunch of other stuff obviously but uh, they, did, they did a survey that found that uh, many have knowledge gaps about cannabis use uh, you know whether it's during pregnancy you know health risks associated to it you know consumption 
and um, you know they want to be able to make sure that nurses are educated on cannabis. I hope they not only educate them on just you know not only any negative effects, but also educate them on the benefits as well. Absolutely, Al. That's for sure. You know, le- nurses are our frontline workers in the healthcare industry. Uh, most patients will see the nurse and speak to the nurse at a much longer rate and in much more detail than you do with your doctor. Doctors are flying in and out of the room, taking care of the urgent needs and what you need done by him. The nurse is the one that gets all your background, that you have the conversation with. They definitely need the education. Oh, yeah, no doubt about it. You know, we need the doctors learning. We need more people learning all about this. So we just got to keep spreading the word, don't we? Yeah, absolutely. So it's great to see the Ontario Nurses Association coming out on this and saying, you know, we want some education. And that's fantastic to hear. Yeah, that was at uh, CBC Ottawa, actually. CBC Ottawa. Okay, Kim, yeah. this one here. I think this one, this is this is one, you, this next story we're going to bring up, this is one that you and many other patients as well, myself, have concerns about. Absolutely, Al. I've discussed this on the show many times in the past, and that is what will legalization mean for our prescription and medical cannabis patients in this country? Um, I have said before that I think that it could be the end of cannabis as a medicine in this country, bringing on the, the, the legalization regime for everyone. And I've had some concerns about that. Coming to us today from a story on Yahoo Finance, uh, medical marijuana in Colorado, is it game over? Uh, there's some, some concerns in Colorado that the medical community is, uh, cannabis community, is taking a back seat to the legalization regime. Yeah. And, you know, that's something that I've talked to many patients. They have concern about that. And and there's actually, I'm sure some of the professionals, the doctors and stuff, have concerns as well. Because if they move towards the recreational theme of everything, then things like the research and and the studies and all that seem to take a back seat. And, and that's not what we want. Absolutely. I mean, without the medical industry, the medical cannabis uh, community and and doctors and and patients and stuff, the research stops. Um, And that's that's devastating for all involved. Uh, And and it's it's a big fear with legalization happening in Canada on whether this will take place here. People are saying, uh, you know, well, if if there's so many hoops to jump through and we don't don't have doctors that are prescribing, we don't have doctors that are educated on cannabinoid therapy, so they're not uh, prescribing it as a medicine. If it's legal, why bother going through the medical regime when I can just go to the store, buy it myself, and self-medicate without a doctor's knowledge, without a doctor's input at all? Well, this they, will hurt us in the long run. Yeah, well, they say that uh, the sales of, in Colorado of medical cannabis went down for the first time in 2017. It dropped $10 million versus the year before. They also yeah. say that you know an application for medical cannabis... Uh, can take anywhere from one to three business days, and if there's an error, it can even take longer. So some people just turn around and say, "Well, it's just probably easier for me just to walk down uh, over, you know, a street or two and get it from Buddy there at the store." Yeah, yeah, and that's what legalization brings forth. If patients um, find it too difficult to navigate the medicinal regime, why not just use it as a rec? recreational quote-unquote uh you know drug that i can use Mm. just the same as buying uh, my liquor from the liquor store i don't need a prescription for that so i'm just going to self-medicate it will take away from the medical uh you know testing and uh studies and everything else that goes into the medical cannabis community with patients yeah yeah exactly well if anybody's wondering there's eight states that have passed recreational marijuana laws in the u.s and there's 30 that passed medical marijuana so, you know, like, for them to, to fade away, it's just obviously 8.30, more people, we need medical marijuana. So. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and it's a fear in Canada with legalization on the horizon as a nation. I wonder if we will see the same sort here with less prescriptions being written and more of the recreational yeah. market being accessed. Okay, well, we're going to move on to our next one that sounds a little mysterious to me. 
And I had an ask because the pharmacists in Quebec say patients should get medical cannabis from them and not in the mail. <laughs> and here comes another thing out of Quebec. Uh, Quebec, Quebec, Quebec. I, I just don't know. You want everything so strictly regulated that I, I'm almost seeing it's it's – negligible to have it legalized at this point we've got more rights and freedoms the way it is now pre-legalization yeah like you know they're not even gonna, even on the recreational and they're not even going to be able to grow their own cannabis not correct and now uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah quebec i have no words for quebec uh, for people that reside in the province of Quebec, my heart goes out to you. Uh, I don't, I don't know what to say about Quebec. I, I just can't wrap my head around what they're doing there. Well, they say that there's a group there that reports that um, a December 19 or 2017 survey of a thousand Quebecers that 48 percent of the residents uh, support the distribution of medical cannabis in pharmacies. Well, yeah, uh, yeah, Adam Greenblatt is quoted in this, and he he agrees, and he says that despite limitations, Greenblatt uh, feels that, and others at Canopy Growth anticipate the pharmacists will be begin dispensing medical cannabis within the next few years. So it sounds like Canopy Growth is on board with Quebec in their dream of uh, having pharmacies distribute our medication. Well, so is Shoppers Drug Mart, as we've seen in the papers lately, uh, where um, they are you know, looking for people, hiring people in the cannabis industry in order to help as a marketer or whatever their, their company. And um, I do know that uh, some of the pharmacists, there is a course offered to their pharmacists to learn about uh, cannabis. So, yeah, they are gearing up to be the distributors of uh, the cannabis. Yeah. Yeah, it's sad times for the cannabis plant that it gets put into a pharmacy along with the side pharmaceutical medications when we have fought so long and so hard for uh, release of this natural plant. But would a pharmacist be like going to a dispensary where a patient, well, a patient couldn't just walk in and get it. They still need a prescription to go in and get it. If a pharmacist is distributing yeah, it, yeah. they may need a prescription. But pharmacists yeah. do dispense other medications over the counter medications from behind the counter that do not require a prescription. So there are some that are regulated but not prescribed. So they have to be uh, dispensed by a pharmacy, although you do not require a prescription for them. So cannabis may fall under that category as well. It may. It may. That's right. Well, all yeah. we do is we'll find out over time. Yep, we most certainly will. And yeah. from Quebec, we're going all the way over across the country to Victoria. That's right. Let's get this done. Let's wrap her up. We're almost out of time. <laughs> all right. Just before we go, we'll get in this quick short story on the city of Victoria. City of Victoria, as we all know and love, are we're the first to license cannabis lounges and dispensaries in our country long before the legalization platform was on the table in this country. Um, now they've taken a turn. They have decided that all of the cannabis dispensaries in the city of Victoria that are been denied licenses by the regulatory body they are now talking about going after landlords of those that are still operating without a license and having uh, fines levied against landlords for renting the space for these illegal cannabis dispensaries that sounds like basically what they did in Toronto well, Kim, it's getting close to medicating time that uh, we should maybe wrap this up. What do you think? Absolutely, all enjoyable as always, and we'll see you all next week. Yes, yes, we'll be back every Monday. It'll be released at Lifestyle Radio at approximately 4.20, somewhere around there. You know, depends what happens. Okay, uh, that's our reefer report for the week of January 16th to 22nd of 2018. And in closing... Weed, I'd like to say thank you for listening to our Reefer Reports podcast. And if you enjoyed it, please share it with your friends and relatives. 